Well, Pat Cox was the man who first taught me. Um, in fact, all of my training really comes from Pat. And at the end of the year, he said to me, oh, Eddie, what are you going to do when you leave Polytech? And I said, I don't know, Pat, I'm a bloody awful designer. <laughs> so he said, why don't you try editing? And he was just setting up the first independent um, editing service in the country. And he said to me, well, I haven't got any clients yet, haven't got any money, but if you can keep yourself alive, then I'll train you. I don't have everything in my head. I want a director who can come in and play with the stuff with me. But I also require that, that director to have done their homework. Because you can't, you can't play unless, un, unless you really know what it is you're playing with. So when you get into a situation like Patu, where your footage is coming in from seven or eight different sources, it could be up to four cameras running on the same event or something on the, on the big events. Your sound is separate and you don't know which sound reel pertains to which camera. In a doco like Patu, that's a plus, not a minus. We cut at Medita's house in Auckland where she was living at that time. And there was a certain amount of presence around, uh, uh, police presence. Medita thought that we would um, be better off cutting somewhere more private, because we were literally right across the, from the gates of Mount Eaton Park. <laughs> we up stakes and moved to Waiheke Island. And Medita would have a chair which was just sort of right there at my shoulder. And she didn't, like some directors do, lean over and say, cut there, cut there sort of thing. What she would do would be to explain to me what the nature of each particular event or march or confrontation was, the feeling of it. There was a point at which I all of a sudden realised that this person sitting beside me, who was born in this country just the same as I was, had a totally different experience of this country that I thought I knew. Because it was quite hard to go back into this cutting room every day uh, to face the stuff which I was now beginning to understand was actually rooted deep in our history, not in South African history necessarily, but deep in our history as well. I'd cut Scarfies with Robert, that was about the fourth film or so that I'd cut with with him and um, I really enjoy his head. He is full of energy and life and vibrant and totally focused on what he's doing in film and just loves film and the thing that I noticed above everything else on Scarfies was that when it came to the editing room he put his ego on a hook outside the door and then walk in. I remember quite clearly the first assembly that went up of Scarfies and Robert went, holy shit. But he didn't panic. And his first response was not, how can I get myself out of the poo? Uh, how can I make this film better so that I look better? It was, what can we do for the film? How do, we, how do we make the film tell a better story? The material that's used in Mouth Wide Open, the film about Ted Coubre, um, is quite idiosyncratic, particularly idiosyncratic to Jonathan. And it's delightful. We tried to get money to do it on 35 mil as befitted a man who shot in 35mm and all of the material that we we're using is in 35mm. However, <coughs> um, I think that the New Zealand Film Commission was extremely short-sighted in um, the, the money that they funded for it <coughs> and could not see their way clear to putting another 30000 in so that we could shoot on um, Meg on 35mm. I had about oh, umpteen different roles. I started off as an animatics editor for films two and three. And that was about three months. And that was all I was meant to have. And then um, Mike Horton came on the job. 
and he needed an operator. And so I trotted over to Jamie and said, oh, Jamie, um, uh, Mike needs an operator. I've waited a long time to operate for him. How about I do that? And that was, that was sort of a film too. And by this time they they were in the first year of shooting, of course. And just everything was going. And film three, which Jamie Silkirk was cutting, was it didn't didn't have anybody assembling it. Um, Jamie wasn't available to do it. Annie, I need a, an assembly editor for for film three. Who do you suggest? It was a lot of fun. Ja Jamie was terrific. He. Um, I sort of put my assembly up and Jamie came in and did his pass, so like he directed me on that. So we worked at like director and editor. And then we got a cut together which would pass for um, the criteria that the tax department needed. And, um, and also that cut was used to, um, to help the um, visual effects people start to understand what was going to be coming up in film three, got sent over to the sound people so that they would begin to know what was going to happen for them. Um, the composer Howard Shaw came in and had a look at it so that he would know what was ahead of him. And then of course Peter dismantled the lot and started from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> it was seven years of very extensive and quite profound learning in some ways, but it was seven years away from New Zealand then there it. Mm. And, and for me that's, um, I didn't realise how profoundly that was affecting me until I actually came back in, into New Zealand documentary. There's been documentary made of, of the Aramoana massacre and it's a good one, but it wasn't made from the point of view of what um, Robert was trying to do, which was to look at what it was like for just ordinary people being caught up in something as big as, as that was. Right from the very, very beginning, Robert and the two producers used a process um, in research and in writing and in shooting and then after the editing had been completed and taking the film back to, the, to those people that needed to see it before the public saw it. And that whole process was a good process. Um, it's, it's the sort of process, for instance, that Barry Barclay uses, the sort of process he used on Tangata Whenua. I also very firmly believe, especially with documentary, and for me, out of the blue, <coughs> sort of grazed along the edges of, of documentary because people depicted in it were still alive. If you don't approach documentary in, with the right spirit inside you, with the right reasons for doing it, it's going to foul up on you. A lot of it's simply to do with the clarity of of your mind and the clarity of your heart when you step into dealing with something that is about people who are still living. Because we know absolutely that it takes about five seconds for you to destroy somebody in a cut, in an edit, on national television. Easy peasy. And if you ain't clear about why you're doing it beforehand, then you shouldn't be in that position of being able to do that.